what we do at the food pantry is we give out food to members of the community who live and work here, who are in need uh, of some help with food, making uh, ends meet with their grocery bills. Um, we give out food every Tuesday and Thursday from uh, 1230 to two o'clock. We serve approximately 90 to 120 families per day, two days a week. It's richly rewarding. It's, this is like true religion and it's really good for the soul, for my soul. And I, at this point, quite honestly, can't imagine what I would be doing with my time if I wasn't doing this. We're voluntarily being the hands and feet of Jesus. God is planting seeds. It's, this is the gospel in action. It's kind of the gospel with a hard hat. And um, it's real stuff. And, and God's doing work in all of us as we do it. I'll just say that when I started doing this, I, I didn't, I wanted to serve, but I felt like I was waiting for a call or a burden or a feeling. And then I read that God's work in us is to will and to do his good purpose. Does it, I didn't have to wait for the feeling. But as I'm doing this, I'm gaining some of that compassion. I have a little taste of how Jesus felt when he looked out at all the crowds and all he had was a couple of fishes and a couple of loaves and he, he had compassion and he just, he, he saw the need. And so that's growing in me, it's, it's a beautiful thing. There are people who just delight to, week by week, be part of that team. There's a team that prays for people when they come. We have Bibles in English, Spanish, and English and Spanish for anybody who wants those. Food, conversations, it's a powerful ministry. Uh, that's the heart of Jesus, the heart that gives, the heart that shares. And, uh, as I was uh, getting ready, I had the sermon finished about uh, three and a half, four weeks ago, turned it into the team. But two weeks ago, I got a, a piece of mail. I walked into my office, and Ramel, who uh, works with Sean and I, kind of our ministry partner in the office there, uh, she says, you got an interesting piece of mail. Do you want this? So I took it, and, and this is a, a life-changing piece of mail with, with bad news and good news in it. The bad news, uh, it comes from the legal solicitor AG of Switzerland. That's who it's from, really. It says right there. And there's even a stamp right here that makes it very official because you can't fake that sort of thing. And it let me know that a, a uh, relative of mine, an Arthur Harney, who I never knew about, passed away nine years ago, but he left $7,950,777 that's all going to go to me. So there's the good news. I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, but all I have to do is send them some money to help them handle the legal fees and the shipping and all that, and then that money's going to be mine. They'll probably have to they'll probably want a little bit more money, but trust me, this, this uh, almost $8 million, that's going to be mine pretty soon, and you're all going to get a piece of the action here, let me tell you. So I'm pretty excited about this. Um, there, I, I had somebody come to me after the first service, and they said, yeah, my, I'm dealing with somebody, I, I think it was, he said his, his grandparents or grandparents got one of these, started sending money. It's a scam. It's a ripoff. There's no Arthur Harney. Somebody's stealing from people. And it tends to be older people who worked 40, 50 years to earn a little bit of retirement, and they start throwing their money after a false hope. So it's kind of funny, but it's kind of sad. And I got this two weeks ago. This, this is really, I mean, my name's right on it, and it's to me, and it's uh, you know, a very legal document and all this, but it, it's an absolute scam meant to take money from people, money that doesn't belong to the people that are stealing it. The passage we're going to look at today deals with that topic. I just happened to get that two weeks ago, but we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles or your Bible app, you can open to Ephesians 4. And we're in this series where we're looking at Ephesians 4 and 5, where the Apostle Paul is writing to this church in the city of Ephesus, real people in a real church. And the big theme in this part of the passage is that when you come to know Jesus, so if you're a Christian or if you become a Christian, when you come to know Jesus, your life changes. There's sort of this out with the old. There's old behaviors and old attitudes and old ways that you live. You leave that behind, out with those things, and now you're going to be transformed and in with some new things. So in this, just these few verses, verses 25 through 28, there's three different examples of the, the way your life changes when you walk in the presence of Jesus, when you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, out with the old, in with the new. So listen for those three things. We've already taught on some of these, but we're going to be looking at the last verse today, all right? Verse 25, Ephesians chapter 4. Therefore, each of you must 
Put off falsehood. Out with lying, out with falsehood. And speak truthfully to your neighbor, for you're all members of one body. So the first thing is, stop lying, be honest, stop falsehood, and begin to speak the truth to others. That's a transformed life. That's what Jesus does. He changes people from liars to truth tellers. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Then the passage goes on to verse 26. We looked at this last Sunday. In your anger, do not sin. Leave that in the past. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't ignore your anger, right? And do not give the devil a foothold. So, so again, out with anger that's pent up, that's kept inside, that isn't dealt with, that ends up becoming explosive or hurting others, and in with a life of peace. Deal with those things. Walk, you know, ba- battle against those things. So out with anger, in with peace. Now, here's the third thing we have in this passage. This is what we're going to focus on today. Verse 28. Anyone who has been stealing, an old way of life, anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. Stop. Leave it behind. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with your own hands. Do something. Get to work. That they may have something to share with those in need. This one verse, this one verse is this powerful picture of the transforming power of Jesus. Think about it. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but they must work doing something useful with their own hands, going from stealing to working hard, and then that they may have something to share with those in need. Here's the picture. A thief who becomes a philanthropist. Someone who steals, who's looking for chances to be generous. That's transformation. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, when thieves become generous, that's the power of Jesus changing a life. And so, Lord, this is our prayer today. As we look at this passage, as as we just lean and dig into this verse that, that has a whole world of lessons for us, will you speak your truth to our hearts? I pray that every one of us online and on campus, that we will listen, not for the person sitting next to us, not for someone we wish was here today. We would listen for ourselves and let you speak your truth to us this day. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. This would be a really easy topic to kind of write off for you. I don't have a problem with stealing. Before you start saying that, hang in there and listen for a few minutes. Because just like last week when I talked about there's many faces of anger, anger takes many faces and and, shapes and forms, stealing can look very different to different people. And before you say, I don't have a problem there, let's think about this a little bit more deeply. So the way it was, what things are like before we walk in Jesus, live in his power, or maybe even when we are, if we're not paying attention, the way it was, there's overt, obvious, and big stealing. The kind of things that we all recognize. There's, There's stealing that everybody goes, well, of course that's stealing. Somebody walks into a bank, and they're armed, and they rob the bank. They take money that doesn't belong to them. We all go, yeah, that's stealing, obviously. And most of us us go, I don't do that. Hopefully all of us can say we don't do that. But uh, if you can't can't say that, just raise your hand right now. We want to pray for you. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, But but somebody who sits behind a computer and creates this kind of filth and steals from elderly people who are struggling and who gives them false hope, we would all say, that's stealing, right? We say, that's, that's wrong to take money from other people by, by giving them a false hope that they're going to get something out of it. Go, no, that's, that, that's not right. A person walks into a CVS or a Walgreens drugstore and takes a backpack and just starts grabbing things and putting it in the backpack, puts it on their back, and walks out without paying. That's called stealing. You say, well, but it's happening. It's more common. It's still stealing. Well, maybe the police don't do anything about it in some places. It's still stealing. You're taking something that doesn't belong. We would all say, that's stealing. I was talking with a pastor this last week where he lives. They've closed down lots of the drugstores, and the ones that are still there has everything under lock and key, and there's still people coming in and stealing things. I asked asked one of the local drugstores here. I said, does that happen here? They said, all the time. I said, how do you deal with that? This is right here in Seaside. I said, how do you deal with that? They said, we aren't supposed to do anything. I said, well, then how do you... What, how do you handle it? What's, what's the economic model for that? And then this retail person looked at me and said, we just charge you more. Someone's got to pay for it. They're taking it for free. We charge the, the people who are honest pay more so people who are dishonest can steal it. That's, that's, to, me, to me, that's we're on the obvious so far. To me, that's obvious that it's wrong. 
And, and so here's what the word of God says to those who are openly, overtly taking things that don't belong to them, all right? Anyone who is stealing must steal no longer. Stop. Don't, don't keep living that way. Don't keep taking things that don't belong to you. Anyone who's stealing must steal no longer. Now let's go a little bit deeper, okay? The way it was, laziness and dishonesty that leads to stealing. There's other kinds of stealing that don't seem as obvious. So you might go, well, I don't rob banks, and I don't go into CVS and pick, pick, you know, take things and not pay for them. Okay, but there's other kinds of stealing. Uh, not putting in your time at work that you say you put in. You know, you, so you're, say you get paid for a 40-hour work week, and you only show up for 30 hours. Or you have the, the luxury of working from home. But you know, now that I work from home, I don't really have to work the whole week, and so I'll work for 30 hours. But you get paid for 40 hours. If you're getting paid $20 an hour and you had 10 hours you didn't work, you've just stolen $200. So well, I don't feel like I'm going and stealing, but, but that's stealing. It's taking something you didn't earn. Or working all 40 hours, but being lazy in your work. So you only produce 20 hours worth of work. Lots of time on the phone, lots of time doing other things, doing my own thing. And, and you're in an environment where you're supposed to be actively working for 40 hours, but you actually goof off for 20 of those hours. You've just stolen 20 hours worth of pay. You say, okay, well, maybe not robbing banks, but maybe now, maybe that's hitting closer to home for some people. You say, well, maybe I don't think about it as stealing, but that's kind of what it is. Claiming that you did something that someone else did. Stealing the credit. That's a form of stealing. Take, taking someone else's idea and passing it off as your idea. You're now stealing their intellectual Creation, they're, they're something that they came up with. That, that is, I mean, stealing takes all kinds of shapes and forms. None of these things honor Jesus. And so uh, living off the government when you don't have to. When you could easily, perfectly work, but you say, I'm not going to, I'm just going to collect a check. For this. By the way, the government has no money other than what they print or take from other people. And so, so you say, okay, well, I could work. I just don't want to. And, and let me make a side note here. Of all the people on the planet who should be the most compassionate and generous with those who cannot work or cannot make ends meet or cannot take care of themselves, it should be Christians. We should be, we have a food pantry. We have a clothing closet. We do a lot in this church to help people in times of need. If there is real legitimate need, Christians should step up and we should personally and as a church do all we can to help. I believe that with all my heart. We should show the compassion and the love of Jesus. But when somebody who can work and just doesn't feel like it doesn't work and collects a check, that is a form of stealing. It really is. We're taking something that doesn't belong to us. I remember uh, years ago, my mom was a school teacher, taught math and science. For some reason, she was also this one quarter teaching volleyball. My mom was not an athlete. Uh, my mom was four foot eleven. You remember the Michelin man, the little kind of like the Michelin man or like the Pillsbury Doughboy kind? My mom had that kind of build. She was just like so huggable and cute. And uh, my mom's skin, this right up here, this here, and that would look dark for her. She was very, very pale, redhead. If I went, hey, mom, how you doing? I'd give her a little poke. She'd go, oh, and then she'd bruise like 30 seconds later. That was my mom. But for some reason, she was teaching volleyball and she injured her arm. Not a surprise. All right. She had her arm. So they said for six weeks she was going to have disability and be out of work for six weeks. So the government started sending her a check every week for her time not working. She'd worked many, many years in the school systems. They started, well, after one week, she got a sling on it. She said, I want to go back to teaching again. So she went back to teaching. But they kept sending checks. And she was teaching. So she was getting a teaching check and she was getting a disability check for not working. But she was working. So after a couple of weeks when these checks came, my mom and dad talked and said, well, we got to find somebody to give this back to the government. This is wrong. Now, by the way, my parents were not Christians at this time. But they said, this is wrong. The government can't give us money for when my mom's not working, when she's working, getting paid for her work. Even with a sling on her arm, she still was working. So my dad actually got a hold of someone in whoever, he tracked down whoever it was and went through the check stuff and said, hey, where do we send this back to? And please stop sending checks. My wife's back to work again. She's getting paid for her teaching. We don't need disability. How do we send it back? You know what they said? We don't really have a way to take checks back. And my, I can't put it in quite my dad's colorful language. This is before he was a Christian. Um, but he said, you will, you will find some way to take the check back, and I will send it to you because this is wrong. And it took him like months to find some way to actually give the money back to them. I grew up in that, where my, my dad, not a Christian, 
My mom, not a Christian, said, this is wrong to take, they, they said, this is stealing. We can't take, because they said, somebody else has got to pay for this. And, you're, and he said, your mom's getting paid by the school. We can't take money that somebody else worked for and earned and take it for disability when she's not, doesn't need disability. I grew up in that kind of environment, even not in a Christian home, but a sense that wrong is wrong and right is right. And so, so the, these are the sorts of things when you know, laziness in our work environment or a little dishonesty, well, it's no big deal, and I probably deserve it, and it's kind of, kind of uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I did this just in the first service. Right? The other day, I was, I was golfing, and on the ground at the golf course was this putter head cover, this really nice leather one, the exact kind of putter head cover of the kind of putter I have. I'd lost my putter head cover like six months ago. So I thought, this must be a gift from the Lord. Um, it, it, it was green. It matched my golf bag. Thank you, Jesus. Right? This is when I'm getting ready to preach a sermon on stealing. And, I, and I, 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 I'm thinking, I think, well, I got to turn that in. But I'm thinking, you know, in my mind, it's kind of like, well, but, you know, it's just laying there on the ground. Nobody, I'm sure nobody's going to come back and claim it. And, and all these things go, I'm like, no, stop it, stop it, stop it. No. And I took it and I gave it to the front desk. I said, somebody will probably come looking for this. Here you go. But... Like in a flash of a moment, these little things, weird things go through my brain. Like, well, it's probably God's grace to leave you this beautiful, perfectly matching. No. I think it was a test, you know. <laughs> what are you going to do about this, Kevin? You're going to preach on it. Um, but here's what the scripture says. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. And so we've got to say this. There's all kinds of different ways. Now, the way it was, the little stuff that does not really matter. I'm going to go one level deeper. So I, 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 those things, nothing's touched me there yet. Is there anything that might, you know, is there little places I might be stealing? In your workplace, if there's supplies or things that are available to you, kind of get a hold of and use for personal uses. What's it called when you take something that's not designed for you, not for you, it's for your, the business, for the company, and you take it and make it your personal thing? It's called stealing. It's called stealing. And we've got to be careful about those things. And you say, and you, well, but everyone does it. You're not Everyone. You're a daughter of the living God. You're a son of the living God. He provides for you. He'll get you a new putter cover if you need that. You know, he'll, and it's not going to be showed up by taking something. You know, but, but we aren't everybody. When I started working at Shoreline here, Ramel, who is our ministry partner with me and Pastor Sean, she says, helps with this, a lot of different ministry things. I, years ago, um, I, started, you know, I said to her, hey, Ramel, I'm going to give you about 40 bucks every so often. I want you to buy stamps, put them in an envelope that says stamps for Kevin. So if I have something to go out and it's personal mail, you use those stamps. And everything goes out for shoreline mail, you use shoreline stamps. And I actually have made sure, and as I saw, if you run out of stamps, let me know. I don't want her to use the church's stamps to set up personal stuff for me. Because those don't belong to me. They belong to the church. And in my, in my office, there's a little mini refrigerator, and they keep waters and bubbly waters in there. And in the cabinet, they keep a basket that's got like, you know, um, protein bars and little things of popcorn and different little snacks. So when I meet with somebody, I can offer them a drink and I can put out a little snack and see if they like a snack. So if I'm meeting with somebody and I have a drink and I have a snack and they have a drink and they have a snack, I consider that part of Shoreline. I, I use Shoreline things. I don't worry about it. But if I'm in my office just doing my work and I want to grab a drink out of there, I'm now, I'm now drinking drinks that belong to the church. So every so often, I'll give Ramel $100. And I'll say, Ramel, hold on to this. When you think it's time for me to give more money, if I'm using, I'm, and I don't you know, pound through them all day long, but I said, you know, just figure out every so often, and I want to give you some cash to make sure, and I'd rather pay a little bit more. I'm kind of like, if his, this is the line of stealing, I want to kind of like take a couple steps back and just do the best I can to not dance on that line. Because if someone comes to me at Shoreline and says, oh, I forgot my offering, and they want to hand me an envelope, I'm like, I just don't, no, 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 no. Too many pastors got in trouble with that, right? I said, no, there's a offering box over there, go put it in there. But you say, well, that's fanatical. You're too cautious. Pastor Kevin, we don't care. Have a bubbly water and you know, do it on the church. Well, here's what goes through my mind. You all are faithful and generous. And you give to the work of Jesus. Not to, the, not to Kevin's refreshment budget. Right? <laughs> and so I think, of, I think of the person who's just making ends meet, but every week they faithfully give something towards the work of Jesus. I don't want to guzzle that down in flavored bubbly waters for Kevin. I want to make sure that, that goes to the food pantry or somewhere else. It does some, I want to make sure it does ministry. And so in your workplace, in your, that's my place. In your place, what are those things that's like, well, nobody's going to notice, nobody really cares, but you know, but i got to be careful of that. Keep one step back from the edge on those things. Online content. Some of you are very clever and very gifted with tech stuff. And you go, oh, there's stuff out there that's monetized that you have to pay for, but I know how to, oh, here, there it is, it's free now. 
But somebody created that content. Somebody, that's their livelihood. That's their income. And, and, you know, and so it goes through your mind, well, they're so dumb, they can't protect their content. It's my right to steal it. Well, no, that's not, that's not the heart of Jesus. So dig a little deeper and check your heart and, and, and just check your practice. When you borrow something from someone and you never return it, now, if you forget who you borrowed it from or you forget you ever borrowed it, that, I don't think there's, that's, you can't control that. But if you're like, oh, I got this thing, and, and you just never give it back. And I was, I was talking with Pastor Keith about this sermon, and he was, we were just, that topic came up, and he goes, oh, I've got a Malcolm Gladwell book I borrowed from you, a book called Blink. It's a really interesting book about how thinking without thinking. But he said, i got, I got to get that back to you. But when I, he was like, it reminded him, oh, I've got one of your books. And in my library, you can see there's slots where there's books missing. And I don't know where some of them are. That, that's okay. But it's like he, he realized, oh, i got to get that back to you. Just dig a little deeper. Because what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus and what the Holy Spirit says to us today, if you're a Christian or if you become a Christian, here's the word from the Lord. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. Let this be the time that you say the big things, the medium things, the no big deal kind of things that do matter. I'm going to turn that around. I'm going to live in a different way. And then we can talk about the way it could be as we move forward. The way it could be. Followers of Jesus should be examples of hard work. Not only do we stop stealing, but then the next thing is is that the Apostle Paul says, and then work hard, doing something useful with your hands. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands. Work, doing something useful. Do you know in Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis chapter 2, when God creates the heavens and the earth, And he creates perfect paradise. This is before sin. Sin comes in in Genesis 3. Before sin ever comes in. It's perfect paradise. Here's Adam and Eve. They're in this garden. You know what God says? Tend the ground and keep it. Take care of the garden. God says, get to work. In perfect paradise. God says, I've made you to work. To work the land. To to get food. God has actually made us to find joy and delight in the work he gives us to do. And so so the biblical attitude towards work shouldn't be work is a curse. Now, the pain of labor came in after sin. And some of our labor is hard labor. But work itself is a gift from God. Not something to be shunned or turned away from or say, I want nothing to do with, but something to say, God, what is work that you've given me that can be meaningful and can be a blessing? We have to watch our outlook when it comes to that. And so as a follower of Jesus, if you're somebody who says, okay, I'm going to steal no longer, I'm going to do all I can to you know, not do that, I'm going to really work with all that I have, then, then say, I want to make sure that I'm the kind of person that, that always tries to do my work above expectations, whether it's at McDonald's or whether it's for a tech company, whether, whether, whether you're a surgeon or whether you're working in the service industry, wherever God puts you, say, I always want to work beyond expectations. I want people to look at me and see that's what a Christian woman works like. She gives her best. That's what a Christian man works like. What if I don't like my boss? What if I don't like my job? What if I don't like the people I'm working with? If that's where you are right now, give your best. Do something useful with your hands. Be on time. Stay till you're supposed to be done and don't leave early. If you're, if you're working from home, clock in, clock out. Be responsible. Give your best. Work as if it were for Jesus. After I became a Christian, my first job after I became a Christian was I worked at Carl's Jr. And so making burgers and scrubbing the floor and doing the dishes. In my, I was a brand new Christian, but I just had this idea, okay, this, if this burger were for Jesus, how would I make this burger? If this floor were Jesus' floor, how would I scrub it? I, that was just, and, and I, I, I want to live that way in my life. I don't always get there. I don't always get that kind of mindset the way it should be. But I think for all of us to look and say, what if I were doing this for Jesus? I'm going to do my best no matter if people are watching or not, whether people notice or not, or know whether or not people thank me or not. I'm going to do my best because ultimately I want God to be pleased. I want God to take delight in the way I work and what I do. And then there's a witness to hard work. People are watching. You, if you bear the name of Jesus, if you're a Christian or if you become a Christian and you bear the name of Jesus, people are watching. They want to know what a Christian works like, how a Christian lives what their integrity is. And the way we work speaks volumes and can actually open the door for conversations about Jesus. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands. The way it could be, productivity and usefulness is honoring to God. Hard physical labor honors God. 
Hard intellectual labor honors God. Hard emotional engagement in the work that you do, it brings glory to God. It honors God. And, and, and what we're doing when we do something you know, the, the image of God in, in, in Genesis when it talks about we are made male and female in the Imago Dei, the image of God. Part of that image of God is, is, is creating things. In our work, we create something. In our work, we make, do something that can make the world a better place if we're doing the kind of work that honors God. If you work in the ag industry, in the produce industry, you're not just, you know, doing this job. You are helping put food on people's tables. Good food, nutritious food. Remember that. Think about that. I'm, I'm partnering with God in helping to create. I mean, God gives the seeds. God grows things. But I'm helping to create this food for somebody. If you're, if you're an artist, if you're a musician or an artist, you're creating something that's beautiful, that's life-giving, that lifts people's souls and lifts their spirits. Then create with God for his glory. If you're, if you're a cooker in the food industry, you're providing a meal and an experience for somebody. That matters. Keep that in mind when you're doing your work. If you're in the military, we have a lot of military families in our church, you are creating an environment of safety and of health and of protection for a whole nation of people. That matters. You partner with God in that. If you're in the medical field, you're creating environments where health can come from people who are sick and struggling to a point of being coming healthy. That's a gift. If you're in the financial world, you're creating a place where people can have a sense of a future and a sense of, okay, now I can not only have a future, but maybe help out my family and help others out. There's in every place of work that honors God, there's things that you co Create with God. Look at your work that way. If you've been stealing, don't do that anymore. But work with your hands and do something useful. You can feel God's presence and God's joy in your labor, whatever it is, in the work that you do. Say, God, I want to feel your presence. I want to feel your joy. Even if it's hard work, even if it's not exactly the job you want. If that's what you have for now, feel God's pleasure in that. A school teacher who's taught all day long with a little kind of wild little kids or grown-up kids at the end of the day to be able to stop and say, God, I tried to honor you with my life and my abilities to pour into these kids the best I can. And just take delight that God would use you to be a blessing like that. If you, if you work in the, the service industry, industry, if you work in a restaurant or you work in the service, there's, you know, there's people who have a bucket list, a desire in their life is to come to this area and enjoy some of the restaurants here, and enjoy some of the art galleries here, and enjoy some of the, the, you know, the, 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 um, the aquarium or a golf course. or you know, there's, there's things here, the Laguna Seca racetrack. People come from, it's, isn't it, this little, this little area we live in here, people come from all over the world to just enjoy a few days here. Maybe the only time they get to do this. We live here, what a gift, right? But, but people travel from around the world to come here, and many of you in the work you do, you help create an experience for someone they're going to remember the rest of their life. You know, all I do is serve at a restaurant. All I do is I'm a cook. All I do is, a, no, not, not all I do. Do it for the Lord. Do it for his glory. Do it the best you can. And feel his pleasure in that. And be a blessing to others through the labor that God gives you to do. Work a full day of church ministry. After, I, I love to preach. I love to teach. I love being a pastor. Almost everything I do as a pastor, I take delight in. But sometimes there's long days. And at the end of those days, I'm able just to go, Thank you, Lord, for the privilege. And there's challenging things along the way. But I, as, as a pastor, whatever you do in your work, give glory to God. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. Okay, that's then. But then you begin, you must work doing something useful with your own hands. The way it could be. Work produces income that can honor God. When you work hard, you gain some income. You get paid for that work. And you should be able to say, God, thank you. Thank you for this, and thank you for what I can do with this. I can, I can now earn a wage that provides for my family, that provides for other people I care about, a wage, a wage that goes beyond myself. When you work hard, you can take care of other people you love and care about. When you work hard, you don't have to be, you know, kind of, kind of relying on other people to take care of you. One of the amazing things in my life right now for Sherry and I is we have three sons. They're all in their 30s. For a lot of years, uh, we were taking care of them. They were kids. And there was all that comes with that. All three of our boys, now check this out. Some of you that have younger families, all three of our boys, we loved our time with them, but they've all moved out. And they all have jobs. All three of our boys have wives. And they work enough to take care of their family needs. As a dad, that brings me joy. I think our Heavenly Father looks at us as we work hard to take care of those he's put in our life, and he delights in that. I know I do as a dad. 
Doesn't mean if an emergency came along, we wouldn't be there to help, but for the most part, they're kind of they're kind of on their own. And you know what that allows Sherry and I to do? Give a lot more to, to the work of Jesus, to give to churches and ministries. Because we don't have the kids we're taking care of. That, that's just, you know, when you work hard, God provides, and you can use that in many ways to be a blessing. And so, so we then think about the dream life. A journey from taking, stealing, to now working hard, to sharing. And this is, this is a, a radical transformation. And from from being somebody who primarily thinks, oh, what can I get for me? What can I do for me? And even if it's not honest or I'm going to try to get stuff for me, to change from that person, to then work hard and do something useful and then become generous. You go, oh, man, that's a long journey. Can I tell you? It's not that long of a journey. It can happen pretty quickly. I'll tell you about a woman who came to Shoreline Church some years ago. I did what I often do on a Sunday morning. I sit right here and I just talk with people and I pray with people. She came up to me. She was angry. She was hurt. She had not been in church before, or not, not at Shoreline and not in any church for a long time. Had believed in lots of different kind of strange religious stuff, but she was hurting and looking for a place to belong. She got embraced in this congregation. For a couple of years, she came here very faithfully. She lived in the area, lived on the streets here in Monterey. But she came here faithfully. Women's Bible studies, different things. She was here and part of the church. After a couple of years, she gave her heart to Jesus. She, she came to understand that Jesus died on the cross, rose again for her by name. She received his grace. She received his love. And her life began to be transformed. She got a part-time job, and then she eventually got a full-time job managing a gas station in town here. She rented a room in someone's house so she was no longer living on the streets. And I remember the day she came up to me. And she was one of these people. She never really walked anywhere. She kind of, kind of danced and ran. She was always like moving with energy. And she came up to me one Sunday morning. She kind of came up here, and she wanted to tell me, about something God had put on her heart. We'd had some rain the, next, the week or two before. And she said, I still have friends who live on the street. She said, I have some friends who are really poor. She didn't see herself as poor anymore. She said, I have some friends who are really poor. So she said, I went to Home Depot and I bought some of these blue tarps and I set them up where they sleep and where they stay so they wouldn't get wet when it rained. And she took a little bit of what she had and she went from this place of taking and wanting and you know, getting her anywhere she could to working hard, and the, the trip was just a heart change that said, this isn't all for me. And she went and got things to provide for some of her friends who were still living on the street. She set up some tarps. It didn't cost her $20,000. It probably cost 30, 40, 50 bucks. But it was a changed heart and it changed life. And that's where God's trying to take us. Do something, work hard with your hands so that you can then notice and care and love others. Living the dream life. How can I notice the needs around me? As, as you, you know, let me read this passage, the whole passage one more time. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. It's that next step. And so we can notice the needs around us. We can get our eyes off ourselves. It's not always, what do I need? What do I need? What's my new thing? But all of a sudden now I'm working in a way that I have enough coming in, modest or a lot, whatever it is, to say I can actually look around and I can see needs and notice needs and see what people are going through. I can say, God, give me your eyes to see what's around me and see when some, somebody's hurting and when I can help. I can, I can feel what other people feel and I can even say, Lord, is this moment for me? Is this a need I can meet? And I'm not so strapped financially that I'm actually in a place where I could... If I see a need and feel like God says, this is for you, I can step in, I can do something. How beautiful is that? What a transformed life that is. Because anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. Leave that behind. But now we work doing something useful with our own hands so that we may have something to share with those in need. So what is living the dream? What does the dream life look like? Living the dream life. Now I contribute to people in need. I hold what I have loosely. I don't hold what I have. See, see, we can be struggling, start to work, get something, and hold it with a vice grip. Mine, mine, mine. Never had anything, now it's all mine. Or we can say, Lord, I live with open hands. I can actually plan, plan to help others. Set aside some to share. And, and, and if you're online, and you're part of another church, give to your church. If you're part of Shoreline, give to Shoreline Church. If you're part of another church, bless your church and give there. But, but beyond giving to your own church, which should be part of our lives, we should say, then now do I have some more set aside so that if I'm just going through my day and I hear about a need or I see about a need, I'm gonna, where I, know, I know that part set aside, that's not for me. That's waiting right there. That, you know, that $20 in my purse, that $20 in my wallet, that, that, you know, that, that $1,000 I set aside wherever you are economically, that amount I set aside, when I see a need, I say, Lord, are you stirring my heart? Is this something you want? And the Holy Spirit just goes, do it. 
You're not giving them yours anymore. You're giving them what God's put in your care. Because the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from the Heavenly Father. So the book of James says every good and perfect gift. We work hard, but God provides our intellect, our physical strength, and all that we have. And so we keep ourselves available to share with those in times of need. One of the things we do at Shoreline Church, and I actually, last week, I shared something. I, I misrepresented. Uh, I told the first service that this event coming up, pull, pull up on the screen that this event is coming up. This is two weeks from now. We've got Gary Thomas, one of, I think one of the best communicators in the church today, going to be here at Shoreline in our worship center uh, doing an event. I told the, the congregation first service last week because I didn't know. I said, oh, and it's free. But it's actually not. See, it says right there, $30 per person. That's partly because we're giving you a book that costs $24.99. The book comes, if you register, you get the book and refreshment and childcare. But if there's anybody who wants to go to that and they can't afford it, they still come at Shoreline. I've often said, hey, when you pay for your registration, if you've got some extra, pay for someone else. If you have just enough, pay for yourself. If you don't have enough, register anyways, we'll cover it. And almost always, there's one or two people that come up to me when we're doing something in the church, and they'll say, listen, Pastor Kevin, if you get to the end and there's anybody who needs to be covered who can't afford it, let me know. We'll help. There's people like that because they've set aside some of what God's given them, and they have means to do that sort of a thing. We're the church, so we never tell anybody you can't come. But I want to challenge you. Here's something I realized that for the longest time as a pastor, about every 15 to 20 people I would talk to had a really tough conflictual something going on in their relational life that was really tough and hard and about one out of every 15 or 20, now it's about one out of every two. Almost everyone I know I talk to right now, there's some kind of conflict in their relational world because our world is getting so conflicted and so negative. And and so that, that one evening seminar is all about how do you deal with those conflicted, tough relationships. I challenge you, if you can be there, register for that. You can go to the Connection Center or do it online if you're online. But that's going to be an amazing training opportunity. It's 30 bucks, but again, if you can't afford it, just say, can't afford it, we'll register you anyways, and God will take care of it because he always does. But that's, and in this church, we have people that just have a heart like that to share freely. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands. You're thinking, Are you going to read this passage again? Yes, I am. Some of you are thinking, how many times are you going to read it? We're going to read it till we all get it. We're going to memorize it together, right? That they may have something to share with those in need. So living the dream life, now I can reveal the generous heart and hands of God in our broken world. Do you know that people who don't know Jesus are watching you? They're watching you. And if you want to show the heart of God, you want to show the heart of Jesus, be generous. Because our God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, Jesus died on the cross that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Our God is a generous God. And we who follow him are growing to become more and more generous. And when you are generous in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your sports teams and where you recreate, and when you're a generous person, people notice, people wonder, people ask questions. And if they ask you why, Why are you so consistently generous? What is it that drives you? You say, oh, the God I know, the Jesus I love, has given me everything. And I'm just trying to live like him. It opens the door for those spiritual conversations. And God wants to bless that and move. And so just quiet your heart right now and bow your head with me. And listen one more time to the Holy Spirit-inspired word of God. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Oh, Jesus, that's our prayer. Humble our hearts. Spirit of God, show us any way we may be cutting corners in the little nobody knows, nobody notices or cares ways. If, if we're stealing, if we're taking what does not belong to us, whether it's material things or credit or intellectual property, if we're stealing, Lord, we pray, if we're followers of yours, you'll change our hearts. Help each one of us as we're able to physically to work hard with our hands doing something useful and help us as a church to see those who cannot work, who cannot provide for themselves. Lord, may the church be the place that cares and loves and gives more than anyone else. And then, Lord God, Give us generous hearts, joyfully generous as we work, as we, as we earn. May we set some of that aside every single time so that we could be like you, O oh God, and share with joyful generosity wherever we go. 
We pray this in Jesus' name as for his glory. Amen. Amen. Before I ask you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you three invitations to things going on that are all quite exciting. The first one is, right now following this service, so like in about four or five minutes, up the stairs here through the door into the garden room, we're going to have a spiritual gifts class. If you have never found out how God has uniquely made you and gifted you, then my wife Sherry will be heading up there right now. She's leading a class for you. You'll do a spiritual gifts assessment. You can find out how God can work in you in beautiful ways. If you've got about 40, how long is it, honey, 45 minutes, hour? 45-minute class. If you've got 45 minutes, right when I send you off with a blessing, just head right up there and join Sherry for a 45-minute class. It, it could change your life. It'll be a blessing to you if you've never done that. And if you're online, when Sherry's done with that class, at 1 o'clock, she's doing another class just for you online and a, li- and a live stream for you. And so go online right now and register and then join Sherry at 1 o'clock. Uh, she also did it after the 10 o'clock service. And so she's done it three times today. Uh, second thing, if you've not been baptized and you're a follower of Jesus. We want to challenge you to be baptized. We have a baptism class today in about 15 minutes. It will be on campus, and it will be online. Uh, And so we want to invite you to join that class at 1230. Our next baptism will be an ocean baptism down at the uh, the, uh, beach down here on September 25th. And so if you go through the class, if you're local online or on campus, you can go through the class, and then we would love to celebrate baptism with you on the 25th. And then the final thing is that the Gary Thomas event, uh, it's not me, it's you, really dealing with toxic, difficult people and navigating those times. That's coming up September 15th. You can register today in the Connection Center there, or you can register online for that. And we want to get a count to know how we're going to make all that work. And so please register in the next week or so for that. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? As you're standing, I want to let you know, if you want prayer today, if you're online, just text us your prayers or call the number if you're on campus. Come into the worship center up front on both sides of the, of the stage here. There'll be teams waiting to pray with you. And if you're new online, just text the word welcome to the phone number you see. We want to greet you. If you're on campus, would you go right to the Connection Center there? And they want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming and give you a warm, personal welcome. As we close this time together, may you hear the word of God speak to your heart. May you let the Holy Spirit search your life in your heart. And if you're stealing in little ways or big ways, steal no more. May you work hard at whatever work God gives you in the home, in the marketplace, in our community. Wherever you're called, work with all that you have for the glory of God. And then may you be generous. Notice. Let your heart go out and share with those in need through the church, And just through your encounters in a normal week, shine the light and the love of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here as we continue in this series next Sunday.